Welcome to Being Patient Live Talks. I'm Mark New, reporter at Being Patient. Today we have a special guest who uh, will share some important information about her journey to being diagnosed with early onset Alzheimer's and how she's turned that around and advocating for others in similar situations. Uh, Betsy Groves joins our live talk. Betsy, thank you so much for joining us. You're welcome. Uh, Betsy, first tell us about your career. You had an interesting career helping people. Yes. Um, so I live in Cambridge. I have a master's in social work. Um, I worked for many years at Boston Medical Center and then moved over to Harvard Graduate School of Education, where I um, uh, <clears throat> taught about um, child mental health and um, and, you know, how to support early childhood development. My focus has always been on early childhood. And it was during this time that you started feeling some symptoms or tell us about the early signs. Yes. So what I noted was with my teaching at Harvard was that I began to have trouble um, kind of wandering a little bit, I think, on my my um, <clears throat> studies or my uh, lectures, and also forgetting people's names in the um, in my in my classes. So I didn't I didn't know what this was about, and um, I, you know, I was just not clue. I was clueless about what it was, and fortunately, I have a friend who is a nurse practitioner who knows something about Alzheimer's. And she suggested that I get um, some neuropsych testing. And the neuropsych testing was not good. It, it really indicated fairly strongly that I had some significant problems with memory. So the rest what is was, what were some of the What were some of the tasks that were difficult to, to perform? Um, remembering students' names, um, kind of, I, I would feel like I was floating off when I was lecturing and I would kind of get out into the space somewhere and I'm not sure that I was focused anymore and I didn't know what was going on. I wasn't even aware of it really. Um, so that's that's what the earliest I think symptoms were for me. And how old were you then? Good question. Um, I'm now 75 years old, and um, this was about five years ago, 70, maybe late stage, 69 years old. Okay. And then, um, so you get the, you go through the evaluation, and, and tell me about your thoughts going through that evaluation. Uh, did you take a lot of tests, and you know, how yes. did you did on them? Yeah, I did a lot of tests. We went to physicians. And... Um, you know, the, the outcome after all of these tests was devastating, that I had um, very, very strong indications of Alzheimer's disease. And then this was confirmed later by a lumbar puncture um, that, um, you know, the blood now, you know, I can't quite remember all of this, but there was this very final diagnosis that I had Alzheimer's disease, early Alzheimer's disease. And what were you thinking going through some of those tests? Um, did you know that you weren't doing well or, or? Yeah, I knew I wasn't doing well, but I just thought this was normal aging. And so I wasn't highly anxious about it. But when we got the results from the lumbar puncture, um, there was, you know, a pretty significant diagnosis. This was, this was Alzheimer's disease. And so... And tell us tell us about that process, uh, for sure. I mean, the, the lumbar puncture, you know, was it, is it difficult or, or, you know, tell me, you know, how were you feeling when you were taking that test? You no, know, I was, you know, I wanted to know what was going on. So I didn't feel terribly anxious about it. I wanted to know what was going on because I knew that there were changes with me and my husband knew it very well. So, you know, once we got the final diagnosis, um, that was a huge change in our lives. 
to say the least. And how was that doing that test? Um, the lumbar about. puncture? Yeah, yes. Um, it's not, I mean, in and of itself, it's not a terribly, um, you know, it's not a bad procedure. Um, but I knew I was anxious about it. So you get the diet and how does the diagnosis come to you? Um, you take the lumbar puncture. How long is it? Do you have to wait for that? And then uh, how is it, you know? revealed or, or told to you? Um, it was told to me and us was the physicians or the medical folks who had said to me, um, this is highly indicative of, of um, Alzheimer's. And so that, of course, was devastating. And it, I, what I can remember, I mean, I was yeah, as I said, devastated. And what I can remember is, because memory is a big problem <laughs> with Alzheimer's, is that I can remember walking along the bike path. I live in Cambridge um, and receiving a call from someone from the Alzheimer's Association who wanted to just check in and um, no, she, they knew that I, I had already had a connection with them. Um, and, you know, just kind of talking with her, she was a social worker, I think, um, and just trying to think about what this meant for my life. A huge change for my life. I was still teaching part-time um, <clears throat> and um, you know, there's a process that you have to just deal with what life deals to you. So, um, that's, that's where I was and that is still where I am. So you get the diagnosis and then did you feel like there was any help that provided after you had the diagnosis or was it left to you to seek out you know, the Alzheimer's Association or, um, you know, was there any, you know? No, there was a, there was a social worker somewhere along the way who said you should connect with the, we would recommend that you um, connect with the Alzheimer's Association. And um, I did that. And um, I, um, became very involved with their association. I served a year or maybe a year and a half on their national panel of, I don't know, early onset Alzheimer's patients. Uh, their home, you know, large home is in Chicago National Association. And we did, my husband and I did a couple of trips to Chicago to do in-person um, presentations and participation. And I can also remember um, going to being invited to go to Houston, Texas to um, talk to a group of uh, physicians there about the journey around Alzheimer's. And I can't remember the specifics of it anymore. It was a great trip. Um, they were very receptive and interested in it. Um, and, um, you know, it was, a, it was a good deal. These were, um, you know, general practitioners, um, not specialists. So, you know, I think for me, and maybe I've said this earlier, apologies for that if I have, is that I think that practitioners, general practitioners, um, have learned to ask specifically about memory for patients who are older than, I don't know, midlife, mid to late life. Um, so that was a really wonderful experience for me. And another experience for me is being able to talk to um, 
not practitioners, but um, experts on trying to understand and decode kind of the specifics of what it is about the Alzheimer's I don't know what they're called anymore. This is again my memory problem, but but there's a a, a, a ASI group um, just within walking distance with me who are doing big time research on Alzheimer's, and so um, we came. I came up and talked to them about what it was like to live with Alzheimer's, and it was a terrific, you know, experience. And. For you to sort of turn around, turn it around, um, you know, your diagnosis to want to help yeah. others. Um, you told me you really wanted to get out there. That um, uh, sort of a philosophy behind that that you had. Yes, I did. I, you know, I think. I mean, it's complicated, and I think those of us who live with complex, uh, live with Alzheimer's, have a range of. Um, thoughts or ideas about who, what, where, why they want to share this experience. And I think because I'm a social worker and I'd always been an advocate, I didn't want to be shy about talking about this. So for some reason, again, that I can't remember exactly is um I ended up, along with my granddaughter, um, on the front page of the Boston Globe, I don't know how many years ago, maybe two or three or four years ago, I can't remember exactly, front page, um, with this wonderful picture of my daughter and, I mean, my granddaughter, Cora, and me standing together in our backyard, kind of holding up our hands like this, <laughs> saying, you know, this is this is the face of Alzheimer's. And, um, it, you know, it got a good, I mean, we were very pleased about it. As I said earlier, I'm, I'm not shy. I mean, I'm not going to advertise it everywhere, but anyway. In that particular event with your granddaughter, what was going on there? Um, well, the picture, it was a great picture because somebody from the Globe came out to do the uh, photographs and I'm pointing in my backyard and we have a shed back there um, and Cora, my granddaughter, was standing next to me and I was standing behind her holding up her hand like this and it it made the Globe. So this is the face of Alzheimer's. I mean, that was the, the I think, no, no, okay, excuse me, wait a minute. Okay. Go ahead, continue. Yeah, go ahead. Um, so I know I've said this before, but I don't feel shy about talking about it. I don't talk about it to everyone and people who know me know me. Um, I'm still singing in a chorus. I'm very active walking. Um, um, I'm singing in two choruses, actually. And tell me, tell me never... what that does. Um, does that, um, do you feel it helps? Um... Oh, my gosh. It's, it's my therapy. It's singing. I've always been, my grandmother was a concert pianist. And I think that she really influenced me about music. And I love to sing ever since high school, college. My husband and I now send in, uh, sing in two choruses. And I think that the music, I can retain music in my head in a way that I cannot retain other information or the music is in a different place in the brain. And so that's helped me psychologically a lot to be able to still do these two choruses. And I actually still, so I probably said earlier, I live in Cambridge, and I'm able to take the uh, MBTA down to the choral practices back competently. And my husband agrees with me that I'm, you know, I know exactly what I'm doing. At some point, that probably won't happen anymore. But again, it's the day at a time thing that you just, you know, I'm doing what I do now. I just sang last night. 
for a rehearsal. And what particular groups are that? Um, is it with is, uh, like a uh, is it affiliated with an Alzheimer's Association or is it just your own group singer? Yeah. No, it's a um, there are two groups. There's the Back Bay Corral, um, which is a you know a, I don't know it's an independent organization that has a long history of you know pretty good choral music. And then there's a smaller one called the Choral Group that's affiliated with um, MIT, believe it or not. That's where we rehearse anyway. And, and so what are you doing for treatment and have you explored clinical trials? Um, yes, I did explore clinical trials. And I don't remember the outcome of them, but I certainly was welcome to, I'm very open to being able to do that. I'd be happy to do that. Mm -hmm. And so um, what type of treatment are you getting now? I'm on medication. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's called Dinepazil. Sure, okay. Do you, do you find that that's helped or, or is it hard to tell? I think it's hard to tell. I think it slows the progress of the disease, but I don't know, you know, how much, how fast, whatever, but um, it does definitely slow the progress. In your work with the Alzheimer's Association, is there a certain area that you uh, want to get across to them that, you know, when you go through experiences like this, that an area to improve to, to help those going through it the most, like something that you felt was lacking uh, for you that you saw that you hope that others can, can get? It's a good question. I mean, I, I may have said this earlier, but I think the Alzheimer's Association has been a lifesaver for me. They have, um, you know, so many resources and they have individuals you can talk with there are ways I can do advocacy through the Alzheimer's Association, which helps me psychologically. Um, and they have a lot of resources. I was, and maybe I said earlier, I was for a while, um, you know, a member of their national early stage Alzheimer's um, group or whatever in Chicago. Um, and they had a walk coming up, actually this, Monday, I think, October 27th. And so for all of you who are listening, um, consider thinking about the walk, which is, oh my gosh, now geographically, I won't know, I can't tell you exactly where it starts. It starts in Cambridge um, along the um, river. And, um, you know, they're great. And they, they're a powerhouse in terms of not only just advocacy, but also research. And what advice would you give to others, uh, maybe on your routine or things that help you with your memory? Well, my routine includes, and again, perhaps I've said this earlier, I'm really a zombie in the morning. I, I have a way slow start in the morning. And then by mid-afternoon or so, everything comes online or many things come online, not everything. Um, and I feel like I'm fortunate. I just probably said this earlier, but I'm fully retired. So I have my own routine. Um, as I said earlier, I walk a lot and I think exercise helps hugely. And Alzheimer's says that, you know, you keep on moving and you keep going. So um, that's been helpful. And we have contributed to the Alzheimer's Association and are active in their activities. Okay. If you had any final health advice to others, um... Uh, whether it be in in diet or exercise or you know, tell me about well, uh, well, but I think both. I think exercise is essential, and I 
I'm sure for health, but also for my mental health, exercise helps me hugely. Um, and I think diet, you know, that's a huge category there. And my husband and I both eat fairly, we tend to eat more vegetarian oriented meals, but we don't always do that. So we have hamburgers and once in a while we might have a steak or something like that. But um, that's, you know, I think exercise and diet really is important. And what's it been like meeting other, uh, th those on a similar journey and being able to offer advice and how have you found interacting with them? Um, you know, everybody has a sort of different feeling. You're very open and wanting to share that you have, but do you, do you find a lot of people feel the other way and are having a hard time with that? Well, I think it's a, you know, it's a kind of spectrum in some ways that some people don't want to talk about it, don't want to share about it. But we have made friends with folks through the Alzheimer's Association um, who have, there's a uh, one couple in particular whose husband is uh, has been diagnosed with um, Alzheimer's and is, you know, declining, as am I. And so we have, we live in different cities. Uh, we have different occupations. Um, I think one thing we share in common is that we have at least one child, and I think they have one or two children who are adopted. Um, and so the, the, this is a couple that we never would have met before. And I think that the connection about all of those things has been very meaningful for us. Because it's not just the disease, but it's it happens to be these other things that are so important to our lives. And you mentioned your granddaughter earlier. Um, how has family um, been important in providing support? Oh, <laughs> we love them. They don't care. We always say, if Mimi says something that seems a little out there, she, we're not sure, you know, what she's doing. They could care less. They just like to play. And I can still play very well. And I love it with them. So granddaughters are the lights in my life and my husband's life too. So, and again, as I may have said earlier, we live close to both of them. So we can see them, you know, once or twice every one or two weeks, something like that. So that, that really is a, it's a blessing. Uh, final question for you. What's next? What's next for you? I don't know what's next. I I don't, and I don't choose to know. I mean, I know, we know, um, you know, kind of brain-wise that certainly I will decline. And, you know, I'm assuming that I may need, well, not assuming, I know that I will need more significant care. And whether that is care that comes to the home or whether they're assisted living or, you know, some kind of place where as I decline, I will need more care. But I think for my husband and I both, we're not going to spend too much time thinking about that. And maybe we're avoiding it. Of course we are. I mean, there's avoidance, of course. But we know that it's coming. And so it's kind of a day at a time. Okay. Betsy, thank you so much for joining us. It's been really valuable to hear your story and dealing with the disease that affects so many. We know your experience will be invaluable to others. Also, thanks to our community for tuning in. Don't forget to sign up for our newsletter on beingpatient.com. We'll keep you up to date on all the upcoming talks. See you next time. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be with you. Take care. Bye-bye.